Hello and uh, good afternoon to everybody, or good morning, or maybe even uh, evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is uh, Matthew Cobham. Uh, I'm responsible for lighting application at uh, Philips Lighting, and I'm uh, based in uh, Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And uh, on behalf of the Philips Lighting University, over the next um, about 45 minutes, I'm going to uh, cover quite broadly with you uh, the topic, uh, a people-centric approach to using light in working environments, which obviously is, is a huge uh, subject uh, to cover in such a uh, short space of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to structure it into three parts. The first part is going to put into context, really, the, the whole subject of uh, light and well well-being. Just to put into context, you know how how, how it all uh, kind of fits together. Then we're going to look at uh, some of the some of the uh, some of the research and some of the theory uh, around it before the third section of the, the presentation, which will look at uh, four examples of application. So I thought I'd start off with this. Um, some of you may know of this project. You'll certainly know of uh, the architect uh, Le Kabuti. Um And I should also just emphasize uh, another point, which is that th th this, this presentation has been uh, kind of put together principally with, with architects uh, in mind. Although, of course, you know everybody is very, very welcome to, to to listen to it. But that's really kind of the, if you like, the the, the, the sort of uh, the, the way that the presentation has been uh, put together. Um, but anyway, th this is a project called Le Pavilion Electronique, uh, which was actually uh, a project, a collaboration between Philips and Le Cabuti in uh, 1958 for an exhibition all to do with light and senses. And I put this here because, of course, um, it's only actually relatively recent that there have been uh, sort of some huge breakthroughs in our understanding of how uh, light uh, influences us. Uh, but of course, well before that, uh, Le Cabutier and of course many other designers uh, have been working with light and uh, trying to uh, trying trying to use really you know kind of what we what we understand uh, and what we what we feel, and that kind of that uh, that kind of balance, if you like, between what's known and unknown uh, is, I think, very nicely put by um, by Motoku Ishii the well-known Japanese lighting designer who said this, light is a great influence on human sensitivity. It reaches the depths of one's heart and awakens something asleep in there. So I thought that was a very kind of poetic way of really summing up uh, th this point about what's known uh, and unknown. And what I'm going to try to do in this, uh, in this webinar is kind of pull out some of the uh, aspects of, of, of research and then really kind of look uh, at how we can actually uh, apply them. However, when you look at uh, keyword searches on the on the internet uh, in the in the architectural world uh, through architectural magazines, well-known architectural magazines, and then you, uh, according to how many hits there are on on certain keywords, then this is the kind of thing that you come up with. This, this of course, isn't uh, very very scientific, but it gives you uh, an indication of how uh, importantly certain subjects are seen uh, by architects. Uh, so happily, you know, daylight and, and light in general is, you know, seen in some way as being you know, quite important. But I just want to draw your attention, actually, to the bottom right-hand corner here. Hopefully, you can see my arrow where it says appropriate light, and that's going to be really one of the the threads that's going to run through right the way through the the presentation. Is about having the appropriate kind of light for the situation you're in, uh, and then thinking about uh, what that means from a, from a well-being perspective. So let's um, now put the subject of light and well-being uh, into into perspective. And of course, it's it's a huge uh, huge subject, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, first of all, uh, there are many ways that light can influence us. Uh, for example, infrared light uh, is, is well known, uh, can uh, detect, uh, can be used to detect heat. Um, ultraviolet light is used uh, many thousands of times uh, a day to uh, help deal with uh, jaundice in newborn uh, babies very, very uh, successfully. Uh, eye strain 
is, if you like, a, a, a kind of a, a sort of direct kind of physical effect, an effect that we actually feel, of course, in the, in the, in the, in the muscular system in, in the in the in the eyes. Um, so that's all, you know, that's something that we, we experience if we're unlucky, uh, either, you know, in poorly lit or office spaces or other environments. And then as a, as a purifier, uh, for example, for, for water. And then there come uh, certain acute effects. And of course, uh, seasonal affective disorder or SAD syndrome is one of those uh, well-known and very well-documented uh, effects. And then there are other acute effects, uh, such as, for example, the gene expression in, uh, in the liver, liver. And then we get into talking about uh, the hormone of darkness, or melatonin, which is going to be one of the, the main things we're going to talk about in, in, this, uh, in this presentation. And we're going to talk about the circadian response to, to, to light. Um, and to, to do that, let's start off by looking at uh, some of the some of the fundamentals. Now this can get um, become in depth very very quickly, so I'm going to try to uh, kind of uh, simplify it. And in fact, I'm going to jump to the next slide. I'll come back to this one uh, in a, in, a, in a second. Um, this one I'm going to start off in. If you, I just draw your attention actually to the the left hand uh, image here. Really, one of the main things to try to remember in this presentation is there are two, it's now been shown, and I'll show you some of the research later, it's now been uh, shown that there are actually two routes uh, which, when there are, um, when, uh, when light is detected in some way at the back of, back of the eye in the, in the retina, there are actually two separate routes. One is the visual route, so that goes to the back, to the uh, visual cortex here. And then there is the non-visual response, which uh, goes through a whole range of different things, which we're not going to go into to detail here today, but does uh, also go through the pineal gland, which, uh, which is what secretes melatonin. Now, what I'd like to ask you to, to do is to just remember this, which is shown up in the top left-hand corner. It's the, the eye-brain system. So if you're not a, a lighting specialist, then kind of one of my requests to you is that you never again after this presentation, think of you know the, the human eye and the brain somehow as being you know separate. It really operates as a complete uh, system, and from a design perspective, it's it's really critical to understand that because of the influences that light, of course, has on the visual aspects. That is, you know, always we we uh, if you're fortunate enough to, to be able to see that you experience uh, every day, but it's the non-visual aspects which is what we're going to concentrate on uh, particularly today. So, as we've already mentioned, um, uh, light is, is received in the, in, in the retina, and then you have a range of uh, what are called uh, different times, types, types of receptor in the uh, ganglion cells, which range from, uh, for example, the, the, the rods, which uh, primarily detect uh, movement and low, uh, low luminance levels, and then to put it in a kind of oversimplified way, you, you then have the RGB uh, detectors or the, or the cones that you can uh, see there. And then you have um, what was actually only very recently uh, discovered, the third receptor, which has a, a melanopsin photopigment uh, in there. Um, and there are many, many different people who are involved uh, in its discovery. Um, one person who is regularly quoted as kind of making the discovery, but it, I have to just emphasize that it involved um, you know, many, many different people, but it's certainly worth uh, Googling on the internet uh, a person and a team who uh, uh, published a paper in 2002 uh, linked to this. But it was discovered uh, before that uh, by Foster and team in at the end, just in 1999, uh, linked to to mice, where uh, they looked at mice who didn't have a, a visual uh, system, so in other words, they didn't have uh, rods and cones, and that they were uh, showing a response which was affecting uh, the uh, suppression of uh, melatonin. So this is this is the guy. This is melatonin, uh, and often refer, referred to as the hormone of darkness because if you are fully, fully adapted, and, we'll, and we'll, um, we'll, you know, we'll come to that uh, shortly, 
then it's mainly only secreted during during the uh, the hours of, of darkness or in preparation for uh, uh, the hours of uh, darkness. So this is kind of an idealized uh, sleep-wake uh, cycle here. You can sort of see here, I already mentioned that um, melatonin is primarily only secreted during the hours of darkness. So you can see here, this person has a kind of a perfect life. Uh, they have higher levels of melatonin during the night, which is what is one of the things that uh, helps make you go to sleep. Then that drops off uh, during, during the uh, daytime, and then that rises up in line with what's happening uh, with, uh, with light outside in the evening, and then that helps make them uh, become sleepy, and then they go to sleep. So that's kind of an ideal situation, which we will refer back to later, and you'll see that in, in practice, um, that is actually happening less and less because of the way that we are, are living with uh, kind of modern uh, lifestyles. It's also worth noting that in fact we're, we're not the only uh, things that have, a, um, uh, that, are, that have melatonin uh, which is secreted. So here we can see, if, you can, if we can get it to come up pretty quickly, here you can see a morning glory flower which uh, like many plants also has melatonin uh, and, a, and a circadian system. And you can see that uh, that's opening up. So what, you, what can you actually do with something like that? Just as kind of a little bit of a, an aside, what can you actually do if you were to put uh, different plants in, in, uh, in order because they, they wake up at different times of the day? You can actually create something called a, a linear garden clock or a linear uh, flower clock, uh, something worth uh, Googling uh, on the Internet. You'll find quite a lot of information about this. And then you can uh, you know, really create kind of a clock in your in your garden. Quite a yeah, quite an interesting uh, thing uh, thing to do. So I already, we already emphasised that it's um, it, it's not to do with uh, vision, uh, particularly the the circadian circadian response. And you can see that uh, because uh, people who are unlucky enough not to be able to to see. Uh, have a visual response also do show a, a circadian response and that's been shown uh, in a number of uh, pieces of research for example uh, Seisler in 1995 and also before that by a Foster and team um, with, with mice. So I already mentioned about so you know the, the, the way that we're, we're changing our, our lives and of course that that's really occurring in, for many reasons, including urbanization, increasing urbanization, more and more people uh, living in cities. And then this all links to very often lack of space and certainly uh, lack of uh, daylight uh, contact. So that, that is a reality. And of course, you know, what we'll get to later is then what can we actually do about it? How, you know, how can we uh, apply it? Of course, ideally, you you know we you, we you live and work in beautifully daylit uh, spaces so that uh, your 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 sleep wake cycle is uh, well regulated uh, and then you can live a comfortable and also healthy life. But that unfortunately is not uh, not reality. So then, this is where the role of uh, artificial can play a role if it's used uh, if it's used in the right way. So what have, has the world, world of, of research done to actually help um, create this link with application? And that's what we're going to begin starting to look at now. So the first really important thing to mention is about characterizing different types of people. And I mentioned earlier that actually everybody's uh, very, very different. So the world of research has characterized people into, first of all, larks, so people who, who wake up um, early in the morning and then typically go to bed uh, earlier. So all called, so they're also called early chronotypes. Um, and they have a, a, a circadian rhythm of that very often less than 24 hours, 23 point uh, something uh, very often. So this is where, the, where the, the term circadian actually comes from, circa diem, which means about a day. The other type of, uh, uh, of person is, in, 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 if you look at a lot of research papers, is an owl, uh, because they, they, uh, they, they show nocturnal uh, type behavior. And it's been shown that people very often with this type of, uh, type of uh, chronotype, a late chronotype, uh, have a scheduling rhythm of more than 24 hours. So light 
and darkness is important to what we call entrain your your body or create a, you know uh, to act as a good conductor for for your body. So it's not just about having light; it is also about having darkness, which you saw in the, the kind of idealized sleep wake cycle uh, that we saw earlier. And this links with about that image I showed you of the city. The first point is that there's an increasing amount of research to show that firstly we're not getting enough light, and we'll come back to that point later on. And then secondly, we're not getting enough of the right kind of light. So this is not just about uh, you know putting uh, increasing light levels everywhere. This is about having the right kind of light at the right times um, in the right in the right place. So let's look at an example. This is a little bit of a, a, a slightly humorous example, which looks quite complicated, but I'll explain it to you. It's actually relatively straightforward. Uh, you can imp uh, Google on the internet that this man, Stephen Wolfram, who was uh, kind of, uh, yeah, quite, I'd say he's quite sort of obsessive in, in many ways. Uh, firstly, obsessive in terms of recording information, and secondly, record, uh, obsessive in his quantity of emailing. So he uh, put a brown dot, which is what you can you can see on this on this graph here, a brown dot for every 300 emails, sorry, 300,000 emails that he sent, and that's what you can see is the brown orangey area is where he's sending emails madly, and then the whiter area is where he's basically sleeping, and it, apparently according to this, you can even see sometimes he's even emailing, uh, you know, during periods when he should be sleeping. But what you can see here is uh, basically how his uh, sleep-wake cycle kind of slips, as you can see, particularly in the late 1990s, uh, according, to his, uh, according to his records. Um, and this is where we bring in the, you know, the term Zeitgeber, which is basically an influence uh, on your sleep-wake cycle or on your, your circadian uh, uh, system. Uh, which is, and light is one of the, the influences uh, of that, one of the Zeitgebers. Uh, but here, if you look at his uh, if you look at his website, you'll see that actually an, uh, an event occurred in 2002, which kind of brought him back to kind of a, a, a normal, more normal life. And apparently, it was that his wife uh, complained very heavily about his behaviour, and so that uh, you know that's one of the for him, if you like, that was another light giver. Um, you can also see here this slightly lighter patch at the top. That's when he's eating, apparently. So uh, anyway, worth having a quick look at on the on the internet. So let's look at uh, two aspects, um, pull up two aspects from the research papers and before we look at uh, application. The, the, the first is about quantity of light, which we already uh, referred to. So you can see this is in, in Lux, for those of you in uh, North America, you can uh, sort of more or less divide these uh, figures by 10 to get uh, foot candles. Um, and then here you can see that up to a certain point, around about 1,000 Lux, um, the more light you, you have, the more effectively melatonin is suppressed. So that's, that's the first point, and that's you know, perhaps uh, worth uh, remembering. And the second point, again also related to quantity of illuminance, is the effectiveness of the quantity of light to, to make a shift. Now you'll you'll sort of know this perhaps from uh, jet lag. You know it takes you uh, you know a few days typically. To, if say if you're traveling to the United States or to Asia, so you've got sort of six or, or eight hours of, of of jet lag. It takes you a few days to recover. And the more you can be in um, in ideally daylight, or if not in the right indoor lit uh, conditions. Um, as quickly as possible, fitting to the time of, of day, the actual time of day that you, you are there, then the more uh, effectively the light will have, the more effect the light will have at shifting your, uh, your circadian uh, rhythm. So that's the first point about quantity of light. And there are many, many uh, things to consider, but the second one that we're going to look at is to do with uh, the actual part of the, the spectrum. So for those of you who are not lighting specialists, uh, in terms of what we call photopic uh, vision, which is uh, basically uh, daylight adapted uh, state of the eye brain uh, system, that's in the, you know, the central part of the spectrum here, sort of a green yellow part of the spectrum, which just if you don't know this already, uh, is at 555 nanometers. You can see a lot of information about that on the, on the internet. 
And then it was uh, there was a, paper, a fascinating pub paper uh, published in 2001 by uh, Dr. George Brainard, who I actually had the, the privilege of uh, giving a talk with uh, last week. And uh, he and his team uh, have shown that the, the bluer parts of the spectrum, and in fact really definitely in the blue uh, spectrum, uh, around 460 to 470 nanometers, is many times more effective at uh, suppre suppressing melatonin. And actually what's published in the, in the paper there is about four times more effective, uh, but um, yeah, that's kind of on the, on the conservative side. It, it's really conservative side rather. It's really many times more uh, effective than the uh, uh, the, the sort of green yellow part of the, the spectrum. So those are two aspects. First of all, the quantity of light. Secondly, the, um, the, 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 the actual part of the spectrum that you, you're using. So I'd just like to ask you to kind of try to uh, remember those, those two points as we start to look at application. So uh, to kick this off, we're going to take a, a light-hearted look at the world of uh, evidence-based design, the world of uh, applying this. Um, let's get this uh, little film going. Hopefully you can hear this. Uh, my colleagues tell me that it's maybe there's no music. Okay, apparently it's okay. Okay, so that was just a little bit of a, a light-hearted introduction to the, I, I would say, the, the main part of the presentation, looking about uh, how, how to, to apply uh, all of this. And that's really kind of the main point, actually, you know, trying to make a link between the research world and the world of uh, application. And so that's, you know, really one of the, one of the, the key aims, really, of this, of this presentation. So here we're going to look at the world of uh, patient rooms. Uh, we're going to look at light in schools. We're going to take a, a brief look at uh, light in offices, trying to apply some of the things that we, we uh, look at in light in schools and light in patient rooms. And then we're going to come back to the world of uh, healthcare. Uh, why have we got two healthcare uh, examples? One of the reasons is because the healthcare, just by definition, is extremely heavily regulated. So it's quite a, kind of quite interesting, I, I think, anyway, to look at examples from that, that world because they're very, very carefully uh, documented. What I'd like to ask you to do, though, 
even if you don't work in any of these uh, application areas, is not get hung up on the specific areas, but just really look at them um, as kind of vehicles, if you like, for the discussion. So kind of try to pull out elements from them and then also think about you know, where else they could be applied. Of course, like in healthcare, is nothing new. Uh, Florence Nightingale in the 19th century, uh, she put a lot of effort into trying to keep uh, soldiers, particularly during the Crimean War, as close as possible to to, uh, to daylight. As she really saw, uh, you know, saw uh, uh, that it had some some impact. And in fact, even before her, uh, this is an image from 651, so AD 651, in the Hotel Dieu in Paris where if you read around this, what the description around this image is, what they're trying to do is keep uh, patients who they believe anyway have the best chances of survival. They're trying to keep them as close to the, to the, to the daylight. You can kind of uh, see that here. Um, and then the ones that they believed, rightly or wrongly, unfortunately, but anyway, they believed didn't have much chance of survival, then they moved away. Now, I thought this image was quite interesting because it demonstrates a little bit that already at that time, um, you know, the, the whole discussion about space was already a, a big a problem. So, okay, we all talk about lack of space today, but it's nothing uh, new at all. So the question is then, you know, really, what can we what can we do about it? Okay, so um, let, we're going to look at the role of light in healthcare in a, in a few different domains. First of all, linked to sleep, then anxiety, uh, depression, and I've got to emphasize here, this is not clinical depression, this is mood. And I'll kind of explain, uh, for those of you who are not um, uh, well accustomed to these different terms, I'll explain this a little bit later on, because it's, uh, it's quite important to, to understand so that some of the differences. Um, and then there are other areas which we're not going to cover today, such as delirium and satisfaction as well. So, the, the first example we're going to look at is a hospital in Maastricht in the Netherlands. I'll explain the setup to you uh, shortly, um, but this was um, uh, undertaken with a, a Maastricht, independent Maastricht uh, research agency, as well as the, the, the hospital staff uh, the, themselves. Um, and the situation was, uh, here the, there were some uh, tests done on the on the north side of the hospital, all on the same uh, floor, uh, where the control room was a uh, a standard room, a standard patient room, uh, where you can see you know uh, curtains are open and closed depending on on the time of the day. You've got a sort of very very standard kind of bedhead unit here, and then uh, in the same area of the hospital, facing the same direction you have the area where there was improved lighting and that's what I'm going to explain to you and then some of the some of the results as well. So this is a little bit of an idea of the of the setup. This is actually a mock up um, at uh, Philips Research but uh, you know it's just to give you an idea of the setup. So there's an artificial um, uh, uh, skylight which uh, was there to have show how we show some of the uh, characteristics of, of daylight which I'll uh, explain. There was then the possibility for patients to to control the ambience amb ambience of of the room, and then actually the third element of it, really quite an important element, was patient control itself. And there's a lot of research to show that if you give uh, patients the right kind of control, obviously control that they can easily use, they can easily understand, then that makes them feel that they have more control of their environment and can reduce anxiety levels. So let's uh, show you a little bit about how this works. Um, on the top here, this top graph is the, the same thing that I showed you earlier, a kind of ideal sleep-wake cycle, uh, high, high levels of uh, melatonin uh, during the night, uh, lower levels during the day, beautifully balanced. Um, this person uh, is experiencing um, basically equal amounts of daylight and uh, really good levels of darkness during the the, the, uh, the night time, and uh, everything's uh, going very well. So this is though, of, and of course that, that that's when you come talk about the interiors of hospitals, that's very very difficult to replicate. So the setup here was um, to have uh, as as you get as as morning approaches to help naturally or more naturally wake patients up. You can imagine here that the curtains are still closed. 
Uh, and so to have uh, warmer color temperatures and, and illuminance levels just gently uh, building up in the, in the early hours of the morning uh, to help uh, more naturally wake um, uh, patients up. And then you can see then the illuminance uh, levels uh, rise throughout the, the morning to actually over uh, a thousand lux. That's not shown on this uh, scale here, but then that, that's what it is. This line here, which hopefully you can see, is actually a thousand lux, and that links to, to research. You know, what, so that's the reason why it is over over a thousand lux for several hours uh, at least. You know, that, you know they're getting uh, brighter light, artificial, but nevertheless making sure that they're getting brighter light in their in the in the patient rooms uh, for for some of the day, and then dropping off towards the end of the day, uh, and then moving towards uh, warmer color temperatures to really set people up for a good uh, night's sleep. Let's explain some of the results, and we can always come back to, the, to that, that graph, but that, that's just sort of, uh, you know, a sort of simplified way of explaining it. First of all, in terms of the measured uh, duration of sleep, uh, here there was, instead of uh, on average, the, where there was uh, in the control room about 400 minutes of sleep, in the, the, the patient room where there was improved lighting, it was uh, over 435 minutes uh, average. So there was, from a, just to use the kind of correct uh, research terms, there was a significant uh, improvement in, sla uh, in a sla sleep, sleep pattern. So that's the, that's the first element, and we'll come back to that in, uh, briefly. Um, the second element was to do with mood. So this is not to do, this is not uh, clinical depression. This is to do with mood, and is using the, the standard uh, hosp hospital anxiety depression score, which is a standard way of uh, measuring patients' uh, mood in hospitals. And you can see here that there is uh, a significant uh, improvement in, in mood. And I should also just emphasise that this is over a, over a week uh, period. Quite interestingly, you can see here that actually. Uh, over that that period in the in the control rooms in the way where there was just standard lighting, people's mood kind of gets worse. Um, so that's you know you can become more and more bored basically with being in a hospital uh, environment if you're there for for a week. Mm -hmm. And to be there for a week, you have to have something in uh, have something uh, pretty serious in the first place. Whereas you can see actually in, uh, with the improved lighting, you know mood actually improved uh, to a significant extent. With the with the improved uh, with the improved uh, lighting, so let me just as far as I can on a PowerPoint uh, show you a little bit what that looks like. Here you can see in the in the early morning uh, the consultant nurse or doctor uh, comes in, uh, and it was, we actually uh, received um, qualitative research, qualitative feedback from uh, doctors and nurses, nurses, saying that they could actually undertake their tasks more easily because patients were in a better mood when they came there in, in the morning. They'd been woken up more, more naturally. They could undertake their tasks uh, more quickly and uh, quickly and easily. Then uh, you go to sort of, you know, the, the, the middle part of the day, uh, luminance levels uh, rising. And then towards the end of the day, warmer color temperatures, lower luminance levels to really get people set up for a good, good night's sleep. So we'll come back to the world of healthcare later on, and we'll look at some other aspects of, of, of this. Let's now turn to, uh, to the world of, of education, of, uh, of schools. And like in healthcare, it's not new that uh, daylight has, uh, and light in general has had a strong role to, to play in education. Uh, Edward Robson, really worth uh, Googling on the internet if you don't already know him. He is a well-known architect of the uh, 19th century. He was c commissioned uh, by uh, a lot of uh, schools um, to, uh, to, to create uh, schools uh, with, with a lot, a lot of uh, daylight. And he came up with um, some really useful uh, rules of thumb, which today have been kind of interpreted into, into daylight factor, such as, for example, uh, 30 square inches of glass for every square foot of door, of, uh, or square foot of floor. And this is actually a school in, in North London 
And there are many in, in Hampstead in North London, and there are quite a number of schools uh, designed by him uh, which are still seen as being very good examples of architectural design in uh, in schools, particularly because of the uh, because of the light, uh, the daylight uh, components uh, in them. So, like uh, healthcare, um, education has also kind of been through uh, fads, often influenced by uh, politics. And in the 1930s, that was the open air movements, where they uh, really got very hung up on the role of uh, having lots of air. In, in schools, of course, by definition, well, perhaps not by definition, but happily, that also led to a lot of uh, daylight uh, entering the, the space as well. However, in the 1960s, particularly actually in North America, but also in, in Europe, uh, there were a lot of uh, windowless uh, classrooms. Now, this was for a reason. It was to do with the conservation of, of heat or conservation of, of other forms of uh, energy. So there was a, a reason uh, behind it. Nevertheless, uh, it meant there was no daylight uh, in, in, in the classrooms. Now, it also kind of was in, uh, this happened in parallel with the, the increase in the use of fluorescent lighting. So this is one of the reasons why, at that time anyway, it was thought to be uh, acceptable. There's a lot of research around this, and I'd really encourage you to have a, a look at it if you're, if you're interested, including that undertaken by Carmel in 1965. Um, where he took 1,000 14 and 15 year olds, and he, uh, 500 of whom were in uh, uh, windowless classrooms, 500 of whom were in uh, classrooms uh, where there was a lot of daylight, and he asked them, and he gave them a very simple task, uh, which was he asked them to do a drawing of what they believed was their kind of, you know, what a classroom should look like, what they would like a classroom to look like. And the interesting but also quite tragic result was that the, the students in the windowless classrooms actually drew their classrooms as having more windows than the, uh, the students who had a lot of windows. So research like that and a lot of other uh, research like it then uh, led to uh, opinion changing happily. Uh, and then that led to you know, modern architectural design of, uh, of schools with you know, passive cooling, a lot of uh, a lot more daylight, um, and that kind of brings me in a in a very kind of sort of shortened way up to the examples I'm going to show you uh, now. Uh, some some examples of where artificial light has been combined effectively with natural light to create uh, environments. Um, which then enable students to sleep better, which and has been shown that that then leads to students being more refreshed, being more kind of prepared uh, for, for, for coming to school. And that those are a couple of research papers which you can, you can have a look at linked to, to that. Visual capacity, well, that's kind of a no-brainer, pretty uh, obviously needed uh, in education. Uh, mood, also uh, kind of uh, a useful tool, uh, not only for the students but also just for for uh, teachers to be able to have their students in the right right kind of frame of mind, basically to be uh, to kind of accept uh, education, uh, and then retaining information as well. Uh, again, pretty useful in uh, education. Uh, again, a couple of research papers there, <coughs> which you might might want to have a look at in more more detail, and then. You know, kind of behavior and also you know mood or, or links obviously you know having the, you know the right behavior really for the situation so the idea here was in, in the examples I'm about to show you was to create a, a, a situation which was easy to use because often when you start talking about controls and uh, you know e as far as perhaps the lighting specialist or architect is concerned, maybe it's easy. Uh, but then you've got to make it very easy for the teachers, uh, anybody using the space, to actually be able to, to use. So the idea was to have, uh, and is with these examples, to have simply four settings. So for example, if where, where you want students to focus, having a higher illuminance level, cooler color temperatures, perhaps where you want them to be calm, you press another button which says calm on there. Um, and then you have warmer color temperatures, lower luminous levels. So this is perhaps what it could uh, look like. This is just an example. Uh, so, for example, in the in the morning, uh, you want to you know uh, get um, 
get your students kind of activated, should we say, um, so you have a more uh, energetic set, uh, setting, higher illuminance levels, uh, higher color temperature, and then perhaps you know late morning, uh, perhaps there's you know a situation where you want the uh, the students to be to be reading or you know having a quiet uh, uh, kind of a reflective uh, period, warmer color kind of temperatures, lower illuminance levels. So I think that, that that's kind of pretty self-explanatory in a way. Uh, when you see it like that, it sounds oh yeah, that's kind of makes sense basically. Let's go look at the results. Um, so these are these are to start off with two field studies undertaken in the Netherlands, uh, Germany, and Austria. Um, and this, these were undertaken using the uh, the D2 test. And for those of you who don't know, this is a standard test, um, actually um, originally designed for truck drivers, but uh, also used in or since used in education to be able to assess levels of concentration. So it's a well documented, well known um, way to assess um, concentration. And here you can see the really significant uh, increase in concentration levels, 19-20% uh, in, in both um, field studies. And you can obviously see the other uh, aspects. Uh, here you can see that the, the other studies from uh, the age groups and also the uh, education level there as well. Now then, when you look at that in practice, so th these are all examples, these are all commercial examples of where this has actually been uh, implemented and then the results measured. You can see they correlate quite nicely, actually, with the field studies. As you'd expect, some exceptions, some uh, where there are high, much higher levels of concentration. So you can say, okay, that's maybe due to other uh, anomalies and other reasons. Uh, but then, and then also uh, one case where it was, uh, you know, although improved actually, um, in not uh, not not the same level as, as the others. But yeah, in general, in general, you can see it fits quite well. <coughs> 17, 18, 19 percent kind of average you know, throughout the throughout the other schools, throughout the, the nine uh, nine projects there. So let's turn to the world of offices. Now we're going to sc kind of scoot through this quite this scoot through this quite quickly actually. Um, and what I'd like to ask you to do is look at some of the examples we've just given in the educational world and in healthcare and look at you know what can we actually use there and what can we actually use there in the world of offices. Now the reason that one of the reasons I'm I'm saying that is that ha kind of happily if you like for, for the healthcare environment you, you have people kind of stuck uh, unfortunately in a bedroom uh, for sometimes quite long periods of time. So in terms of research it's relatively easy to undertake studies. Also in schools um, children are, or and students are often in spaces for, you know, one space for a significant amount of time. So again, you can undertake studies. Now, with a modern way of working, with flexible offices and so on, it becomes extremely difficult to undertake studies in the office environment. Although there have been uh, many attempts, and I'm sure there will continue to be lots of attempts. This I just kind of put up as kind of a light-hearted image. We talk about collaborative uh, spaces. Uh, but I found this image from the, the uh, early 18th century, uh, and I thought, well, you know, if you put a, an espresso machine in the cor corners there and you changed uh, people's costumes, then you know it wouldn't look so different from a, a modern office today. Lots of uh, natural uh, daylight, um, and uh, you know, people collaborating. Uh, but of course, technology has played a very, very strong role in the way we use uh, office uh, space as well as uh, norms and uh, recommendations, which we're not going to spend a huge amount of time uh, talking about. Uh, but like in the educational world, um, light has been really kind of through some up big ups and downs, um, all with good intention, um, but you know, leading to other things that are, were you know, not really desired. Uh, here you can see, this is uh, very clearly an image from 1996-97, uh, as you can see from the calendar. Um, so here, you, here this is a period where we were really kind of obsessed with uh, cut-off angles in, in lighting um, because of the negative contrast screens, which we'll mention a little bit about uh, shortly. The disadvantage was, though, that you can see here, you can see those sharp cut-off angles here, which led to a lot of uh, really quite oppressive environments such as this. Now, of course, this is an old photograph. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see very clearly there are very, very harsh shadows on the columns here 
uh, yeah, pretty nasty environment to, to work on. As I mentioned, you know, this was, of course was a reason, uh, just like the, as we saw in the window of this classroom there, that was to do with energy saving. This was uh, to avoid screen reflections. Um, but of course, computer technology has, uh, has changed and developed a, a lot since, since then, which has uh, enabled um, developments as well in recommendations for, for, for lighting. Uh, and technology has, has changed, so uh, with you know, a lot now leading to a lot more uh, sort of more flexible ways ways of working, and now being able to work pretty well uh, anywhere, and uh, perhaps really uh, anywhere, as you can see this guy is trying to do. As well as the growth of um, an understanding of, of light and lighting. And I, for those of you who are uh, other architects or lighting designers, I don't need to in introduce Richard Kelly to you. But for those of you who don't know uh, about him, he's really kind of one of one of the godfathers of the uh, lighting design profession. Uh, really working in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, uh, particularly in uh, particularly in North America. And he came up with this very, very kind of useful rule of thumb, which you can still really apply today, and I'd really recommend that you do, in fact, ambient luminescence, focal glow, and play of brilliance. And then, kind of, you know, that you've pretty well got the, all the elements you need to undertake a, a really great uh, lighting design. And it was people like him and many others who have uh, played a strong role in combining uh, daylight with uh, artificial lights and to really create spaces which are appropriate for their use. So either you know, meeting, greeting, you know, uh, what we're calling the breakout so spaces where you need, you need to kind of, you know, concentrate, and of course, you know, coll collaboration. So that's, I show you those images just you know, very, uh, very, very swiftly on purpose, but to really sort of think about you know, where can you apply some of the things we looked at in, in schools and, and healthcare, well, you know, what can we do with it in the world of, of offices? Which then brings us back to the more or less last example we're going to look at in the world of, of uh, healthcare. Again, because it's very, very well uh, documented, and extremely tightly controlled. So, you know, there's a lot of learning that we can get from looking at applications, I think, lighting applications and design applications in the world of healthcare, even if you don't work in that domain. So the first question is, which would you prefer to work in or, or be a patient in? If you were a consultant or a patient, would you prefer to be in an environment like this? Or would you prefer to be in an environment like this? Pretty self-explanatory, I, I hope, uh, and particularly because, by definition, hospitals are, are places where people are experiencing high levels of anxiety, and no more so than in spaces like this, uptake rooms. Now, for those of you who don't know what these are, and I'll just briefly explain, they're pretty nasty places. Uh, they're really, it's where uh, cancer analysis is uh, undertaken. Uh, one of the ways of uh, anal analyzing and detecting where cancerous growths are. They're leg line rooms. Uh, they have to be because uh, of the radioactive uh, tests that are undertaken there. Uh, patients are in, injected with a, a sugar radioactive solution, which then helps uh, detect and uh, show up where the cancerous group growths are. And because of that, patients are naturally very, uh, very stressed, experiencing high levels of ang anxiety. And this is where the first paradox, um, or one of the paradoxes, occurs. For the test to work, you need to be relaxed. Um, and if you're not, then it's possible uh, for, di for different groups of fats to, to show up in different parts of the, bo of the body and actually show up as false, what are called false positive uh, readings. And so it's been shown that if you can reduce levels of anxiety, then you can get um, better results, which is obviously what everybody wants, plus the fact anyway, it's a slightly, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a slightly more pleasant to experience. So this is an example of, um, one of the uh, one of the a new type of uptake room being analysed at uh, Philips Research here in uh, the Netherlands. This is this is a mock up at uh, Philips Research. Here you can see the patients are getting some some choice about the kind of ambience that they like, and you can see also it's combined with uh, images 
So it's not just the light, but it's creating, you know, it's, it's the light really working uh, in harmony with images. So images they would be given the choice of, or for example, uh, you know, a boat trip down a river. Uh, the images mustn't, also mustn't be too exciting because that can also lead to false positive uh, results. Um, so it's really about, you know, the light working in harmony with, uh, with uh, images. Uh, and, and it's being shown that this can lead to lower levels of anxiety when the tests are being undertaken. Uh, in his well-known uh, book, Human, Human Factors in Lighting, which for those of you who don't know it, is, um, is yeah, it's very, very, very kind of readable document which makes a very nice link between the world of research and the world of uh, application. So if you want to look at this in more detail, I'd recommend uh, getting a copy of that. And uh, let's read through this uh, quotation because I think it's um, you know, it's a nice way to finish off. Light is like fire, a good servant but a poor master, and it behoves of anyone who's involved in the design and specification of lighting systems to be aware of the impacts of light on human health. So that's a message to all, us all, basically. Um, I, just by definition, I would imagine that everybody here who, who's joined on the, this webinar is in some way uh, interested in, in the role that light has to play uh, in application. So I'm kind of, I know I'm talking to the converted, but what actually matters is then what we do with it out there um, and how we convince other people to actually think about it as well. And that brings me to um, the last quotation and kind of bring to, to bring the presentation in a full circle, if you like. And I'm putting this quotation up also up to, uh, to provoke you a little bit, I hope. Uh, from, so coming back to Le Corbusier, who, said, who had this opinion, light is the key to, to well-being. So I'd also be very interested to, to hear from you, uh, whether you agree with that, maybe you partly agree with it. And then to, to complete the webinar, I've got a couple of questions for you, uh, which we can either maybe try and answer a couple of uh, now, or if not, uh, we can certainly uh, you know, converse by... Uh, by uh, uh, email or perhaps on innovations in light um, afterwards um, on the, uh, the well-known social media groups. Um, so, for example, so do, do you believe the evidence shown in the research can be effectively implemented? That's kind of a, you know, a question. And secondly, what do you miss to put this all into practice? So, that completes the, um, the presentation. Thank you very much indeed for, for listening. I'm just now turning to my colleague who's uh, working hard on the questions that people are posting. I'm going to try to answer a, quest a couple of them. Uh, we certainly won't be able to answer them all. There have been yeah, really a lot, of, a lot of questions. So I'm just, just give me a couple of seconds. Uh, let me just kind of scan for a couple and I'll do my best to answer a few. Okay, so just bear with me one second. Okay, there's a very really nice question uh, um, posed here. It's actually the, the first question that was asked as well. So I'll read the question out for you. Are there any potential drawbacks uh, to interfering with a natural circadian rhythm in order to fit in with our natural work pattern? Um, okay, and then it also, yeah, it also refers to, to night shift workers. Okay. So are there any potential drawbacks to interfering with the natural circadian uh, rhythm? So, I mean, the, I think the whole presentation has been about the fact that the answer to that is, is, is of course, is, is yes. Uh, and what you're trying to do is to create a na as natural an environment as, as, as possible. And the very fact that uh, I think we, there was a slide hopefully making the point very clearly that we're not getting enough and we're not getting enough of the right kind of light, uh, particularly in you know, modern urban environments, etc. urbanization, we, we refer to that. And that is leading to uh, very serious um, uh, issues around this. The fact that you know, people are literally not about to... Um, uh, able to sleep uh, at the right time. We, there's, a, there's a term referred to social jet lag, uh, which kind of describes this quite uh, nicely. Uh, you know, we all know what jet lag is if you're, if you're traveling. But then you can also experience that uh, just you know, by staying in the same place if you're not exposed to light at the right times. So you give, given the example of, um, of shift workers, 
uh, and that is a you know a particular a particular problem uh, in its and a particular challenge uh, in itself. Um, the, the very fact that, that people are perhaps working uh, between midnight and 8 a.m. Well, you know, what do you do with that uh, when if they're doing that for five days a week and they want to get a normal lead a normal life at the weekend? What can you do about that? And at the same time, you want them to concentrate at work. You want them to undertake their their, their tasks, uh, and they, they, they need to, or ideally, they should be able to shift uh, back to the weekend. There isn't really an answer to it, um, and uh, it also leads to a whole range of safety questions uh, around, uh, you know, from when the, 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 the night shift workers are traveling back as well, and uh, you know, maybe get very, very uh, tired. So it is a that is a particular particular challenge. But leaving those kind of extreme uh, cases uh, aside, just for everybody in a kind of more normal um, day and um, nighttime patterns, there's a huge role that um, natural and artificial light has to, to, to play in regulating our sleep wake cycle. So I'm going to look for another, uh, another one. Okay, so I'll read this next one out. So recent, this uh, it just says. Okay, the question says recent public published articles on have research have suggested concerns um, regarding potential damaging effects of the retina from blue light. Okay. Um, yeah. So this, this particularly. Yeah. This particular. So so, when we, so the question is about uh, LED light. Um, so this this particularly uh, refers to the fact that um, LED light um, emits, by definition, emits light in a very narrow uh, part of the spectrum. So if it's true that if you're uh, emitting light in the wrong parts of the of the spectrum only and in the very narrow parts of uh, the spectrum, then you know, you know there are potential uh, uh, issues with that. Um, what modern lighting uh, systems uh, try to do is uh, to uh, have wider parts of wider parts of the spectrum. Uh, so that's, for example, if you want to create uh, white lights, you start with a uh, what, there are a number of different ways of doing it, but having a blue LED and then using yellow phosphors, um, and so you know you're em emitting uh, white light. Uh, but of course, yeah, if, if you're uh, emitting only blue light in the wrong parts of the only blue light in the wrong parts of the spectrum, and then looking at that source for extremely uh, long uh, periods. Then, uh, yeah, there, there, will, there can be uh, potentially uh, potentially issues. Let's try to answer one more question. Also, you can come back to me as well. Please uh, send me an email if you're not satisfied with the answers I'm giving. I'm just trying to give her the answer um, answer the questions kind of quite quickly. Okay, some questions here. I'm afraid I can't quite read. Okay, so yeah, we've managed to answer a couple of the questions. I'll deal with a couple of questions. Uh, please uh, email me uh, as well. So my email address is uh, Matthew, which is M A T T H E W dot Cobham C O B H A M, and then at Phillips dot com. So that's Matthew dot Cobham at Phillips uh, dot com. Uh, and yeah, I'd be very happy to converse uh, with you, discuss it with you. Uh, that'd be uh, that'd be very interesting. And I'll also be on some of the uh, social media uh, groups as well, such as Innovations in Light. Well, hopefully we'll be able to continue the, uh, continue the discussion. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to further discussions about this.